Now it's time for the real Q and A. After that other one, oh, uh, like, I guess I lost Jimmy, so it's just me. Um, is that Alamo guy back there? I kind of want to water. <laughs> um, anyway, let's start the Q and A. So, um, any questions? Oh, here's one already. Oh, what? That's a cool question. Um, yeah, I was just talking about next door. Like, I'm really interested. I'm not really interested in reality, obviously. <laughs> I'm interested in this kind of stylized, heightened reality and um, sort of um, creating a different world. And that's why it's so cool to see the movie on the big screen because you're really immersed in that world when you um, when it just sort of takes you over. And costume wise. You know, it's always, for this movie and also for Nowhere, I had kind of in my head a specific idea of what it would be like, but there is a level of, it's not really real, you know, <laughs> where it's all, everything's kind of a little bit iconic and a little bit not um, just kind of, oh yeah, what the kids down the street are wearing. It's, it takes that and takes it sort of to a different sort of exaggerated level. And in this movie, um, the co costume designer was Kathy Cooper. Remember her? Yeah. What the fuck? What? No way! Chris <laughs> Ball there. <laughs> Kathy Cooper. Seriously. Chris Ball. You remember Chris Ball from um, the Locations, uh, locations Guy? He, Chris Paul was in yeah, the, is in the other screening, and Jim Feely was in our New York screening. That's so okay. So you, that's why you asked about costumes. Well, I'm glad I didn't say anything ter terrible about no. But you did like as it, you know everybody. Chris Paul, the locations guy. The budget in this movie was fifty cents. So I mean, literally, it's like you have to create these iconic looks for these actors. Um, with nothing, and I remember that the famous the black dress of roses I think was yours, right? And you cut it shorter so it would be like you know because I was like I wanted it to be that kind of sixties miniskirt thing for Rose. Yeah, <laughs> well, as it should be. Um, no, but and then did and then the jacket she wore didn't that belong to the camera guy? And the and of course the fa remember the famous one was. Jim Feely, the DP, we took literally clothes off his back for Jimmy for the, when they changed after the thrift store, that, that red and blue, the, the yellow and blue striped t-shirt and the green, green, and the green pants. pants. And, and Jim Feely is literally like 6'3", like he's this big dude. And so they're super baggy. But I remember Jim showed up in that outfit one day and I said, I want Jimmy to wear that. Like literally, that's how, the, that's how this movie was. But it's incredible that you know, with this sort of weird, <laughs> I mean, you did a fantastic job because with this weird sort of homemade, just grab and go sort of aesthetic that the looks of this movie are just so iconic and, you know, just you. really amazing. No, thank you. But the question is, where did the eat fuck, where did the eat fuck kill button come from? Was that you or was that Therese? Because I mean, Therese, of course, was. Yeah, well, it's like so brilliant, but. We have some. We have some. Oh, wow. <laughs> no. Anyway, no, Kathy, it's so great to see you. I mean, it's like literally, thank you for doing such a fantastic and amazing job. That's so funny that Chris Ball, <laughs> Jim yeah. Field, who's who's missing? It's just like. Uh, like who's going to be at the next like Michael, <laughs> Michael Kranz. Like, remember him? But yeah, that was. But you can te you can testify. I was just talking to Chris. We were talking to Chris about it. Um, it was a hellacious shoot, right? <laughs> the earthquake hit the sec first second day of filming. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the earthquake. So we, and it, we and still it was, filmed that day. Yeah, and it was also it was like it was yeah. cold. It was like January. It was all nights. It was a very rough shoot. But I mean, I look back on it now with such incredible fondness. I mean, it's it was. But during the time, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> as did everybody. As did everybody. I think. Right. I mean, we didn't have a real sound stage that our production office and our stage where we built the hotel rooms 
it was like an old tile factory in Sun Valley, and it was just dusty and cold and dirty. That the worst was that warehouse where we had the the last scene. Where our security it guard felt, got robbed. It felt like we were there, and it felt like we were there for like weeks, but they, we couldn't. The whole shoot was like 21, 22 days, but it seemed like we were there for a long time. It was all night, and it was just cold, dirty, and just freezing. Awful. Yeah, it was. It was intense. I remember the. I wonder if Peter Backel's going to show up. I remember <laughs> the AD. Well, just the AD Peter. Um, we won't mention his last name, although I just did. Um, I remember literally wrapping it like six thirty in the morning, seven a.m. The sun's up. We're exhausted, dirty, so tired, and like literally, he's like cracking open a six pack. <laughs> like that's the kind. Of, that's the kind of shoot it was. So. But you know, it's cr isn't it crazy that it's like to this day we're sitting in a sold out theater watching it? <laughs> if not, thank you to you guys and thank you to the, the, the fans that kept it alive all these years. But the, about the colors and the sound, right? The colors and the sound and the costumes. <laughs> Kathy Cooper. <laughs> Kathy Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Do you have a question here? Yeah, we were just talking about that. We should just combine the two Q and A's. Um, it, yeah, no, it was it was Therese, I think. Therese, again. Therese had done, I think I shot Andy Warhol. Yeah. I think before this, so she was had made a foil mm -hmm. factory for the Andy Warhol thing. So I think she was aware of it and said, okay, I can you know, get some spare foil and cover this. Yeah, because, you know, it was something that, you know, the location guy was just here, and I was very, you know, we had a super tight budget, obviously, and, and you know, no time and no money, and but I was super adamant about, I don't want anything to look normal. Like, we're not going to walk into, like, a normal motel. We're not going to, you know, I don't want them to walk into a regular bar. Like, I don't, like, everything has to look like strange and surreal and just like a dream or some sort of nightmare or something. And so, you know, and you know, they would get these, and this was just a dumpy dive bar and she just transformed it into this thing. And then, you know, Parker Posey shows up. <laughs> it's like this whole other level of what's going on here. Yeah, and I think, I think like, as it even kicks off to have Amanda Pierce as the, yeah. as the bartender is a pretty good way to kick that off. Amanda's pretty amazing. We were lucky to get a lot of the actors that oh, we got on this movie. Them. Yeah. Well, Greg made me do it. Uh, back there? Uh-huh. Um, okay, I, uh, I've seen this movie, I can't even count how many times before seeing it tonight. And there are certain lines that I remember from really well. And one thing that always stuck out to me, I've always wanted to know about, is when Amy says, I miss my wrestling. <laughs> I felt something was a lot deeper to that, but I could have also just been filling in my own blanks. Uh -huh. I was kind of curious, like, what were your thoughts on that line, and did it mean anything? Really? It's just like all, it's like all the line. I mean, again, I don't want to keep talking about the last Q&A, but it, I was talking before about, this movie was so personal to me. It was literally like a diary for me. And a lot of it was just stuff that I would, I had these notebooks, and I'd just write down, like, like you know, in the very artsy way just little jot down little notes little ideas like this this you know the thing where amy's all oh when I, you know i'm on the 405 freeway and there's an accident i just want to see the bodies and get you know get moving and it, like that's something that i i'm sure i wrote down like because it's a profound thought i had and you know and it turned up in the movie so it, the, i miss my records thing was very you know i love music i love records and you know that idea just that being her home, you know, and like her wanting to go home. It, I mean, I thought it was very beautiful, and Rose's performance of that was really cool. And the album she's looking at is this Myrtle Coil, the box set, and it's my personal copy because <laughs> that's like I said, it's it's all bit like Jimmy, the ministry shirt Jimmy's wearing is my ministry shirt. Like so much of it is like in my my me in that world. So. All of that is very, very personal. Bonus tracks, those are the conversations that we do have. <laughs> Can you say, so, yeah, that soundtrack, that's still, like, top of the heap for me. Yeah. I fucking love Same. the Generation yeah. soundtrack. And that Lush song, 
song, the remix, I still put that on like like I make like a little music mix every month and that still makes it on that on that mix because it's so great. Yeah, it's fantastic. But I wanted to say like when you're making the movie, like how many of the songs on the soundtrack were songs you did you want all the did you get all the songs you wanted on the soundtrack on the soundtrack? And when you were making the movie, you're like, Oh, this Wolfgang Crest song is perfect here. Certain of the songs, like the Nine Inch Nails was very much, like it's in the script, it actually says, it doesn't say, here's he by Nine Inch Nails, it says, Trent Reznor is going to compose an original soundtrack for me, and it's going to be a double album. And that didn't happen, but we did get, we, we got Here's he, which was great enough. Yeah, and we got Babyland too. And, um, is, no, Babyland's not in this movie, they're just, they're just... The song is, but yeah, the song is, but Babyland, because Babyland's actually in Put Fucked Up, and I think it's Sparks. Yeah, it's really fucked up. But, um, it's one of the shows. But yeah, no, so music is, you know, a huge, huge part of my world, and it, you know, alternative music, post punk music, industrial music. You know, this movie is very much what I call my Nine Inch Nails period. I was very into Nine Inch Nails industrial music and very just. It, of all my movies, this is the most angry. This is the most, <laughs> and my movie like nowhere gets a little bit. And also, I was super obviously into slow dive, and it gets a little more slow diving, a little more esoteric. And you know, in the not, later '90s, they get more into electronic music, and it's a little more, um, a little more peaceful than this. But um, in the early '90s, like definitely, like the whole electronic thing is a big. Um, it was challenging in the sense that we had to have a specific screening for Trent Reznor and Perry Farrell for them to sign off on the Portal of Papyrus and the um, and uh, the Nine Inch Nails song. And I remember them sitting. Were, you were at the screening, were you? No, I didn't. We had a screening at Raleigh Studios, and it was literally like me, Andrea, Nicole. And I think just the two of them, and they did not sit together. It was funny, like it was like dueling war, go dueling rock gods or something. They're like, "Yeah, I'm not sitting next to you," and you know, but they're buddies because they did that tour together, right? That ninja tour or whatever. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so I remember um, that screening very well, and and they both signed off on it. And uh, you know, we didn't pay the incredible huge fee they usually get. So it was, you know, because they, they were got it, they got that it was like this kind of punky cool I think I, I think it helped with bands like Ministry 2 like when we did Totally Fucked Up you know which was Greg made for 20 grand um, he couldn't pay for music so they had to give it to him and Ministry was one of the bands I think that gave you yeah I mean, they gave you just Totally Fucked Up has a lot of 4 music. 4AD on it too because of Ivo like he literally is like oh uh, just you know a little queer movie about big, big yeah. supporters because I know when I was in England talking to Alan McGee in the 90s from Creation Records. He was a huge Greg Rocky fan. He's giving me all this music. Give this to Greg. Tell him he can put this in the movie. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so Ed, to answer this question short, is that, yeah, music's always, like, so crucial to all to all of the movies, to this to this day in my, in my movies. Um, I have two questions. One, um, can you talk about what was cut out of the theatrical release and why they made you do that and two um there's a i noticed a credit that said um a special no thank you to uh -oh. that story <laughs> oh, you talk about that? jimmy you want to answer about the what got cut out uh, literally one of my favorite scenes but uh no pun intended um but since you all just saw it you'll probably have noticed that right after the gardening shears incident <laughs> There's a really beautiful close-up after it gets ripped up. So that's that's one of the I think the most shocking shots in the movie that's that was taken away right off the bat. That I always, you know, and he I, missed it. He's like, "Where's my dick?" <laughs> it's, well, we went to all the trouble to make it. You know what I mean? And, and, and it was to kind film of it. it. And they literally they were, they were like made out of like jello almost, and they sat in a bu bucket of blood. And why cut out what you already cut out? I mean, we have it now. <laughs> Do what you want with it. Um, no, I think I think it, there was it was the violence. Yeah, mainly it's the stuff in that last scene. There's a, I think it's a, this, a, this this intro or the last the other intro that it's like it 
it's not a lot, but it makes that last scene like even more intense. It's already intense, but it just kind of takes it to a different level of like. Uh, the, co the company didn't want to. They just said they wouldn't release it with that. They just asked. Going to be like a rated X type of thing. Or like... Well, it, the movie was always rated um, X, uh, unrated. I mean, I literally remember when we were pitching this movie or coming up with this movie. I said to the producer, I want this to be like Last Tango on Pairs for teenagers. Like, I want to make an X-rated movie that's like so transgressive and just like crazy. You know, like I don't want to make like, oh, this little... And it's interesting though, because then nowhere, I was very specific in the opposite. And because nowhere was supposed to be a TV pilot sort of, and I wanted to be... Um, I had this thing about nowhere, like I want nowhere to be PG-13. Like I want nowhere, like literally, like, if you ever notice in Nowhere, which you will be able to see soon, like, hopefully, when we master, when we master it, um, Nowhere, they never say fuck and they never say shit in the whole movie. They have a whole different language speaking around it. But I specifically did that because in my, you know, in my deluded mind, I thought, oh, yeah, I want to get a PG-13 movie and make this crazy movie that, like, literally, like, 13, 15-year-olds can see. And when we submitted Nowhere, they're like, oh, it's X-rated. It's like, what? <laughs> like, it's not even an R, it's an X, like, what? Like, but this movie, I specifically wanted it to be unrated. And um, that's why I was so furious when they made the R-rated version, because when they did the R-rated version, it's funny, my friends just saw the movie for the first, the, um, they just saw the movie, and they're like, they're all, I think we actually saw the, the R-rated version, because I remember it being much shorter than this. And the R-rated version, literally, I remember I said I don't want them to make it, and I was very punk rock and very pissed about it. And um, it's they literally did it for Blockbuster, because in those days, Blockbuster was a thing, and actually it meant a lot of money if they could show in Blockbuster. So um, when they were trying to cut the R-rated version for Blockbuster, they literally, if you like look at the movie as an editor, there's not, re there's no real like, n like sex. There's no real like, not that much nudity. There's not really stuff to cut out. It, there's, and you know, they kept like the shot of Rose in the top, like they kept all that stuff in. The what the MPA said specifically, and I'll never forget it, is. The whole tone of this movie is insulting to us. So literally, just keep cutting it. Just keep cutting it. Just cut it, cut it, cut it till it's just not even recognizable anymore. And then you'll get your already. And that's what they did. And the example to give is that there's that scene where Jimmy and Rose are having sex in the motel. I think it's a, in the bathtub. It, it, it's no, I think it's the black and white check room. You're having sex, and there's a whole. It's like a three minute scene and you have you're like she's repeating what John like you know take it out put it in do this hit it on my thigh <laughs> just, there's a whole long scene and then at the end of the scene they start fucking and they're like ah. in the R-rated version they cut all of the dialogue out there's no nudity not, they're not really doing anything they're just talking about sex in a kind of like heated way but they took it's the, the shot is too cl a close up of the two of them in profile they cut the whole scene out except for the fucking. So literally, it just cuts them fucking. And it's like, what, there's, what's the point of this? Like, literally, they kept the fucking in. And they did keep like Rose's boobs in and stuff. But that's what I mean. It was like so weird the way they were just so, they did not like this movie. So that's why I'm so furious about the R-rated version. And I, and I was trying to kill it for so long. And I'm all, you need to put on big red letters on the box. like. The director says, fuck you for making this, <laughs> making this version. And, you know, like, oh, yeah, we'll do that. And it was in tiny, teeny letters in the back. Or something, you know what I mean? And so to this day, it shows up. And like I said, my friends were like, oh, yeah, I think we just saw the r rated version. I'm like, what? Because that version was never supposed to exist. And, you know, even the, the version that got released, I'm not, you know, it's fine. And obviously it went on, you know, it kept the movie alive for 28 years. But... Um, this, that's why I'm so glad about this version, because this is the definitive version, and all the other versions burn in hell forever. <laughs> uh, two questions. Uh, are there any actual deleted scenes from the generation? And second, are you going to use your version, your, your print, for nowhere? 
the one you showed at, at the USC so many years ago? Oh, you were at the USC thing. Yes, nowhere, nowhere has, unlike this movie, nowhere has, so nowhere has a, quite a few deleted scenes. Not, they're not deleted again, it's just like toned down stuff that, again, it, I don't know why they did it. A lot of it has to do with the Shad and Lila characters, the, the Ryan Philippi and Heather Graham, that in that movie, in the movies, they're just constantly fucking, they're like constantly making out and stuff, and they have a lot of, they got a lot of, um, and again, you don't see anything, but um, the MPA really didn't like that, so um, that's all going to be put back in for no work when it comes out. Yeah, the no. It a lot is about a lot of it is about the chocolate scene. It's just no because it's like it was. It I don't. Know, it just made me angry. But you know, like there's a like Ryan has really in his performance. Like both of their performances are so good, and Ryan has really funny dialogue when he's talking about like again, it's dialogue. It's not like you're seeing like a dick or something. It's like literally like him talking about like oh this feels so good like and. They just cut all, like, they want us to cut all this stuff out. And it's all coming back. Yes. Okay, one more quickie. Oh, wait, you had one already. Something over here. Back there? It was, I was, I was traumatized. Yeah, it was, this question about sex and intimacy coordinators. Yeah, it's like, I've always, um, like, I, um, I've never had an intimacy coordinator on a film set. I work in, I've done some episodic TV and work with intimacy, intimacy coordinators. But, um, and I think they, they're great, and I think they serve a great purpose. For me, in movies, I've always had, like, I'm just really interested in, um, sex and sexuality in, in movies, which I guess is the opposite of Quentin Tarantino, because he says he's never had a sex scene in a movie and never will. And I'm all, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the reason being is that it's not really about, for me, titillation or you know, like trying to, like, you know, because it's, or like voyeurism, because for me, that's what's so great about porn. It's like, porn is so available. It's just like, if you want to watch porn, just watch fucking porn. Like, don't go to fucking Arclight to watch porn. It's, 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 or the, not, not, not Arclight, sorry, Alamo Draft House. Um, but, so it's not really about that, but what it is, is I'm very interested in those moments of intimacy between two characters. And what I always say is that, Somebody that you slept with, somebody that you had a one night stand with, they know you better than your best friend. Do you know what I mean? Like they know you in a way that your mother, your best friend, like it, who the, clo your, the person you're closest to does not know you because they've seen you in your like naked, but also in your most raw, pure self. And that's why I think that's why I find sex scenes so interesting because it's not really about penetration, it's not really about the dick or whatever. It's really more about um, the interaction between those characters. I mean, I was very, very influenced by those sort of early Almodovar movies, particularly Law of Desire and Matador, and that's those, the sex scenes in those movies are so intense and so, they're not graphic, but they really get at what's going on between those characters, and that's kind of something that um, I've always been super interested in. And so, consequently, it's been pretty much in all my movies, so I'm very comfortable with doing it. For anybody who's ever been on a set shooting a sex scene, there's nothing sexy about it. <laughs> it's not. It's not really, you know. I, um, it's it's very technical, and uh, you know, it's it's kind of a miracle when they work. You know, it's like because they're so what they are when you're shooting them. But it's a you know, it's a, it's a testament to actors and how great they are. It's just like the that they sell it and they, you know, really make you feel like you're really in that moment. And it, actually, it's a theory for me of like why Doom and Nowhere 2 have lived so long. It's like, 
it's because you've had sex with all of those characters. You know what I mean? It's like you're so close to them. You know what I mean? You've really been intimate with them. And, and I think they've, it's different than when, you know, you just sort of are a little more, oh, yeah, everybody doing their thing that they always do. Anyway. Uh, I think, like, so I guess that's our last question. We have some buttons to give away, so let's give them away quick. What, what's the, ask a question, Jimmy. Um, all right. Uh, Gregor Rocky has a cameo in this movie. Did anyone find it? Two people said, okay, we'll give two uh, buns away. Uh, okay, the, the other question I asked was, um, uh, uh, the other question, oh, what was I asked? What did, did you get to think of a question? Okay, here, there's two members, there's two cast members from Days and Confused in this movie. Who are they? That's one. That's two. That's the hard one. Like, Parker Cole is obvious, right? Wait, you guys both got buttons. Uh oh, these are stuck together. <laughs> you're like, I'll take two. Why not? Oh, you're right. Okay, what, uh, what's, the other, uh, what's the other question? Um, it's probably. You have to think of new questions. What the? Um, I don't know. Um, uh, okay, I'll ask the Jonathan question again. Jonathan Sheck was in a Winona Ryder movie right after Doom Generation where he was wearing a Speedo. How to make an American quilt. That's it. <laughs> See, that's... That one always, like, people like, what? Yeah. He was literally wearing a Speedo coming out of the water. He was like the, the hunky dude and so hot. Everybody wanted him. Uh, okay, there are two more, I think. And then we got to go, right? Uh, okay, Jimmy, you have to think of one. Uh, it's an old one, but let's see if they know it. Um, one of our favorite pans is uh, in the movie, in the beginning, they jump. Ah, uh, see, puppy. That, that, that's an <laughs> easy one. Yeah. Who said skinny puppy? Wait, <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I see skinny puppy, that's like an easy one. Um, What's the one I said? Fuck. I was, I was thinking of some and now I forgot. Where the, are the ones we asked in New York? Um, there was. Uh, 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 you thought of one. I remember. Um, okay. Uh, what? <laughs> okay. Um, what TV show was Dustin win uh, the cashier? That's it. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. That's a good one. Okay, I think we had two more, and then we got to go. Twenty-one Jump Street. Okay, look. Um, uh, uh, let me think. Um, uh, this is one I asked in New York that nobody got. That's hard. Um, what's the name of the Cocteau Twins song that plays in the Black and White Check Motel Room? Oh, what? <laughs> Summer Blink. Summer Blink by the Cocteau Twins. That's what in New York could get that. Yeah. Well, there you go. Even though so it has a special memory for you now. Okay, this is the last one. Um, there are t oh, okay. This is one that um, that I didn't even realize until I did the remix. There, this uh, this I don't know how to make this a question. There is a band that that bes besides Slow Dive that has two songs in the Doom Generation soundtrack. No, oh, they're all, you're, that's close. What? There's, I think, I think there. Slow Dive has two songs, and there's another band. It's not in the soundtrack soundtrack. It's in the whole soundtrack. It's close to Front Two for Two. Is close. It's a like, it's, it's an, it's a industrial band. Ministry. <laughs> it's too hard. This is a hard one. That's yes. correct. Meet Beat Manifesto. I didn't even know that until I remixed it. We did the remix. And I looked at this, and I was looking at the songs. And I was like, wait, what's this song, Soul Driver by Meet Beat Manifesto? It plays in the scene where um, Jimmy's on the phone and they're in the tunnel. It's playing in the background. And it also plays, La they, that song, um, Paradise Now, plays with Rose and Jonathan when they're in the room choking each other. But yeah, maybe Manifesto, which is a great band from the 90s.
Anyway, thank you guys so much for coming out. Thank you. This has been amazing. I love you all.